Hello, my name is Robert Krauss. I'm the author of W. Degan Treasure Discovered, and the purpose of this video is to give you further information that will enable you to utilize the concepts and the ideas that are portrayed in the book and the subtleties that are involved with swing trading. The reality is that, as some of you may know, my work has been involved with the psychology of trading for well over 20 years, for which period I've been also a professional trader. What I have learned from speaking to well over 500 traders face to face is the fact that Trading and analysis are two different modalities. What do I mean by that? When you're actually trading, especially if you're trading your own money, the psychological pressures and consequences are totally different from when you are just doing analysis in which there is no financial gain or loss involved, or if you're acting as an advisor to another person who is doing the actual trading. Is there some way that these two modalities can be brought together, in other words, to improve your trading and to become a better analyst? The work that I have done in the last 20 years with, as I said, well over 500 traders at the psychological level, the answer is that I have only found one specific way. Not only is this one specific way the only way that I have encountered that brings these two modalities together, but it is also the same route that you will find if you want to be a technical mechanical trader, because that is what the purpose of the book and this video is all about. As far as I'm concerned, the psychological aspect of trading is about 75 percent of the total market activity. In other words, if you have a valid methodology, and we will talk about that in a moment, what is considered a valid methodology by my standards, you will find that even when you have that valid methodology, it only constitutes some 25 percent of the total trading environment, especially when you have your own money on the line. The root, in my opinion, to successful trading and to bring the two modalities together is identical, which is a mechanical trading plan that has rules that can be backtested into the past. And the further we backtest, the better it is. What you're going to find that in the book W. D. Gan Treasure Discovered, which I will shorten to treasure discovered because it is a bit of a mouthful as you will agree. What we're going to find is that this mechanical method has to have rules that do not change, rules that are fixed, and therefore they can be backtested over a period of time. The further the backtest goes, which I call a backtrack, the more validity the plan has as far as those specific rules are concerned. When you put in any new rules, you will find you are going to have to redo the entire backtesting in order to be accurate in your analysis and in your trading. Of course, we know that just because it has worked in the past, that there is no guarantee that it will work in the future. But I can also tell you that if it did not work in the past, then I will guarantee it will not work in the future. 
Unfortunately, this is the nature of our business and the nature of this game. The second reason for the backtest is to prove to yourself at a subconscious level that the methodology actually works. To prove this to yourself at a conscious level is very, very easy. Because you just do your back test of 5, 10, 12, whatever number of years involved. And as you will see when we start working our way through the book with the rules and the various plans that are here, most of these plans in total have been back tested for approximately 46 years. This does not mean that it was 46 years or one specific contract, but the virtual reality came through that with very minor adjustments, the rules are kept constant, and the three different plans that are covered in the book encompass a total of 46 years of backtesting. The reality is that without this backtesting, I am afraid I cannot consider anything a valid methodology, even if it has fixed rules. Two or three years or two months of backtesting, even of an intraday plan, I consider of no consequence. Why? The reality is, and I keep using that word reality because there is nothing more real than facing the market on a daily, weekly, hourly, or minute-by-minute -minute basis that you know very, very soon if your methods and concepts are right or wrong. We are actually in the reality business, whether you like it or whether you don't. It reminds me of the story that Albert Einstein, when he died, he went to heaven. And St. Peter was at the gate and checked the list and said, what is your name, please? And uh, Albert Einstein replied, my name? You don't know my name? My name is Albert Einstein. Oh, St. Peter checked the list and of course there he was. He said, come on in, Mr. Einstein. He said, unfortunately, your room is not yet ready. So we will have to go into the waiting room, like a waiting area. And they went in there. And uh, when St. Peter ushered him in, this looked a very comfortable room. People were sitting around playing chess, listening to music, watching TV, reading books. And as he walked in, a gentleman immediately walked up to him and said, Oh, I recognize you. You're Albert Einstein. He says, Yes. And what's your IQ? And the man replied, Oh, about 140, 145. He says, Hmm, that's not bad. We can talk about music. We can talk about the books. We can talk about the latest production of AIDA. And as they were chatting, another person wandered up to them and said, uh, hello. And Einstein said, what's your IQ? And the man said, oh, about 108. He said, mm, interesting. We can talk about baseball. We can talk about football. We can talk about cricket. But then, as he looked over, he saw a very, very beautifully dressed man with a big cigar lying on the settee, drinking an espresso. And he leaned over and said, excuse me, what is your IQ? And the man smiled and looked up and said, oh, about 75. So Einstein said, 75? How is the market? I think that illustrates the simplicity of it all. Back to our valid methodology and testing that we are talking about. It is the fixed rules that enables you to do the back testing. And it is the back testing that tells you at a conscious level that, hey, this particular concept, method, has had positive mathematical expectations and results in the past of 5, 10, 15, whatever number of years you are actually looking at, be it the daily basis, hourly basis, or weekly basis. But the real problem occurs when you actually start trading the methodology and your subconscious mind, in my opinion, where most of our decision-making process and contentment takes place, it is the emotions that will kick in at that point 
when you are faced with a loss that you do not experience and you didn't expect because your backtrack was not sufficient. Let me give you an example. If over a 10-year period you have done your back test and you've had five losses sequentially in a row, if that occurs again as you are doing your physical actual trading, what is going to happen? What is going to happen is that you will realize, hey, this has happened in the past and it doesn't really matter and you will be able to take the next trade. Because mechanical trading concepts have something very similar to each other. And that is that unless you take the next trade, that is the trade that may be the actual winner, as opposed to waiting to see if the plan kicks in again, and by that time you would have missed two or three trades, especially if some of the ideas are momentum-based. And you will see that it is pretty much momentum-based. So therefore, this is the reason why I have placed such great emphasis on doing backtesting, mechanical rules, and no variation from the plan. I will run through the various basic elements. Number one is swing direction. Upswing from down to up. The swing direction can only change if you get two consecutive higher highs. As you can see, that the change of swing direction takes place when you have a low and you have a first high and a second high. These are two consecutive higher highs. Exactly the same happens in a downswing. You had to be first in an upswing. You make a high and then you need two consecutive lower lows. Bar number one is lower than the high bar. And bar number two is low is lower than the low of bar number one. And this is what causes a downswing to occur. Defining uptrend and downtrend, you can see that the trend can only change from down to up if the nearest peak is taken out. This is the nearest peak. We have been in a downtrend. It's a dashed line. The dashed line indicates a downtrend. The moment the previous peak is taken out and you have been in a downtrend, the prices change when it's taken out and an uptrend is in existence by our definition. The downtrend is exactly the opposite. The downtrend is established when we have been previously in an uptrend, a solid line, and as the prices take out the previous valley over there, and the arrow shows at which point prices change to a downtrend, which is signified by a dashed line. Defining support and resistance. It is always the previous valley, as shown in chart number five, that defines the support when it is tested, as shown by the arrow, and it's clearly defined as support. Resistance is defined by the previous peak holding prices. Unless prices penetrate the previous peak's price point, it means that the resistance is holding, as you can see in chart number six, the previous peak was not taken out. Slope. Slope is the immediate direction of the swing. You can see that here we have an upslope 
and here we have a down slope. The trend can be up, and the slope is also up. Please look at swing C to D. You can see we have an uptrend and an upslope. The line is solid, therefore we are in an uptrend, and the slope is running upwards from C to D. As you can see, the trend turned up at point XX over here. When it took out the previous peak that existed on a previous chart. This trend change occurred from swing A to B. The trend can be up, but the slope is down. You can see this on the downswing D to E. The trend is still up because we are at a solid line. It turns into a downtrend by the time it reaches point E only because the previous valley at C is taken out and that qualifies for a trend change. But nevertheless, from D to E was a trend up, but the slope was down. This one is relatively easy. The trend can be down and the slope is also down. This occurs on the downswing from F to each G. As you can see, it's a dashed line and therefore the trend is down. And also the slope is down from F to G. Remember, the solid line represents trend up and the dashed line represents trend down. As we saw in the previous chart, you can only have four combinations. Number one is uptrend and upslope. Number two is uptrend but downslope. Or number three, downtrend and downslope, or downtrend but upslope. Let us look now in detail at chart 7a, which examines these four phases as listed. Number one, uptrend and upslope. This is clearly shown during K to L. This is T bonds, December 1996 contract, and you can clearly see that the trend is up, it's a solid line, and the slope is also up. Therefore, we have an uptrend and an upslope. If you elected to buy during this time period from K to L, you would be buying with the direction of the immediate trend, which is the upslope, and the trend itself was also up. Let us look at number two, point two which is uptrend but downslope. This you can see in two places. L to M is a pretty clear downslope. L to M. The trend was still up because it's a solid line, but the slope was coming down. The second place that this is clearly visible is D to E. It is slightly more complicated. Why? Because it started out as an uptrend, but changed to a downtrend. And let us have a look at that. D to E, which was the highest point of the move. That is pictured on this chart between 110 and 111, around the area of 110.16 on the bonds. What actually occurred is it was in an uptrend to point D, and it was still in an uptrend all the way down until the previous valley at point C was taken out, and it changed to a proper downtrend as the prices took out 
the previous valley C, as pointed out. And even though the prices swung back up to point F, it was still in a downtrend. From that moment on, when a minor peak formed at F, and you can see the trend run down never changed, and that was the beginning of a major move down all the way down to G. So from F to G, you could see very clearly was downtrend and downslope. Therefore, it would have been advisable to take short positions on this trend run down. In the opposite direction, you saw the same thing happen when prices went from K to L, which was uptrend and upslope. So anytime you were buying during this upswing from K to L, generally the prices and the trading would be in your advantage to go with this particular approach. I would like to explain how the change in swing direction actually occurs. As you can see, the slope is down, down to point number one. And the very next day, it swings upwards to bar number two. But because it is only one swing of the price in the opposite direction from a downswing to an up close on bar number two, this very thin line here on the computer is in white. To me, that represents neutral. And it is plotted only to the close. As you're going to see, there is a big difference when you have two consecutive higher highs in the opposite direction. The very next day, after day number two, when we had a fine line going up to the close of bar number two, the prices opened slightly lower on day number three, mark day number three, and moved on downwards, reestablishing the downswing that was in progress previously, and the previous immediate valley was taken out, and therefore, not only were we in a downslope, but also a downtrend began because we took out the previous valley point. Now, if day number three would have been higher than day number two, then you would have had the change of slope upwards, as we're going to see when that occurs later on. Similar thing occurs. Day number four appears to be rising, but it is only the first rise in the opposite direction of the previous slope. Therefore, once again, the line is very thin, i.e. neutral, plotted on the Fibonacci trader program in white. And we are only plotting to the close. If you recollect on chart number three, we had plotted a thin line from the low of bar number three to the close of bar number four, because only the first up move, i.e. bar number four, had a higher high than bar number three. Now, on the close of bar number five, what we find is that we have a higher high than bar number four. So now we have the two consecutive higher highs than bar number three. So bar number four was higher than bar three, and bar number five was higher than number four. And therefore, it was now legitimate upswing occurs even though the trend is still down, but the slope turns up because we had two consecutive higher highs. Chart number five of the swing direction shows day number six carried on going higher. Therefore, even though the trend was still down, 
as shown by the dashed line. The slope was up and plotted to the high of bar number 6. And this trend down cannot and will not change by our definition until the previous peak over there is taken out as shown by this line. Nevertheless, the immediate slope was up on the close of day number six. Even though the prices swung upwards to the high of bar number six, the trend was still down, even though the slope was up because it did not reach or take out the previous peak that is shown here, and we have projected a straight horizontal line to show where the prices would take it out to create a change of trend. We are now portraying day number 7, 8, 9, and 10. You can see 7, 8, and 9 had higher highs than day number 6, and therefore the upslope continued up to day number 9, but on day number 10, we had a slight swing back downwards, but because it was only the first swing in the opposite direction of the prices, it was only a shift to neutral, i.e. a thin line, and no direct change of the actual slope itself, which can only occur if you have two consecutive lower highs, which did not take place. Also, please note, we had a lower low than the previous low value. Therefore, we can now classify this as a new valley that occurred on the low of bar number three. It is not surprising that when prices approached the previous peak, we have suddenly found some resistance because that is what the normal job of peaks are. If you recall, the previous peak defines the actual resistance that has to break down if prices are going to proceed higher. And this occurred for a momentary pause on bar number nine. Bar 11 is a very interesting bar because we opened virtually unchanged, but then the price is retraced back to the low of bar number 11 and then blasted off to the upside, taking out the previous peak shown over there. This was a major government number day, and when the prices passed the previous peak, the trend immediately changed to an uptrend. Even though it was an upslope and downtrend to this point here, when the trend change occurred, it was upslope and uptrend. The basic swing plan works in real time on the USD bonds. It's a 1987 to 96 10 year back test. And the rules are relatively simple, as you can see if you work your way through it. These are based entirely on the original concepts that we have just gone through. And the program only trades with the trend. In other words, this plan only takes action in the direction of the trend. There's no contra trend action is taken and no uh, pyramiding of any consequence takes place. If you study the rules carefully, I think you will find it of tremendous benefit. Let us now go to how you can do your back test on this particular plan and what you will see that the first year, i.e. 1987, the charts have been kept rather large in order that you can do your back test easily on this full page rather than half page charts. 1987, USD bonds, this is the first year of the basic trading plan, which trades only with the trend. 
I'm going to explain to you the layout of this particular setup so you can follow this with the actual trade numbers in the charts that follow. The first, very first column tells you the trade number, trade number one, and this will be marked as trade number one in the actual charts a few pages later. The date shows you at what date that trade number one took place. L or S shows you whether you are long or short, i.e. did you buy or sell. The price that you actually bought or sold at. The number of contracts you can see is three contracts. If you look down the contract column, you can see that it is always three contracts because there is no pyramiding with this particular trading plan. Also, this plan, as I mentioned, trades only with the trend. The next column tells you the rule number. This does not mean we bought one, but it is we bought via by rule number one. And on the next line, you can see PP. And PP tells you profit protection. And you follow through. This tells you this was profit protection rule number two, as per the rules of this particular trading plan, kicked in. And we took profits on three contracts, which was the original three contracts that we bought a few days before. And that showed us a profit of 30 ticks. What was the cumulative profit? It was 30 ticks. And once a month, you will see that we put the total number of profit or loss ticks for that particular month. So the end of the first month of trading in 1987, we had a 12 tick loss that is shown over here. And the equity of our account, which starts up every year on January 1 at $30,000, it shows you how each specific trade affects our total equity. And you can see that we started with 30000 and we worked all the way down to $20,000. And this was the biggest sequence of losses. And I started out with this particular contract to show you how the plan really works and totally recovers the following month. In one specific trade, we had 354 tick profit for that specific month. And once again, your account was not just back in the original equity, but you were considering up as far as the percentages return on equity is concerned. Okay, you can see marked here every trade number. And next to it is the rule number. And I put the rule number so you can see. So this was trade number one. You took action via rule number one. Trade number two. Again, you took action via rule number one. Where it says PP, it shows you the bar that your profit protection rule number two was hit. And the same goes for the next point along here. On the sell rule number four, you could sell it because, of course, you were in a downtrend, and we only trade with the trend. And you were below the high-low activator. And therefore, this was the ideal spot, as per the rules, to take action. But I would like to point out profit protection rule number two, which occurs two days later. And this is profit protection rule number two kicks in. And you can see that the qualifier is a 0.382 retracement must be above the high-low activator during the trading day. So not only do we have a 0.382 retracement from this point that I'm showing to the low 
of that particular bar that we entered on trade number four. And that gives us two days later a 0.382 retracement, but we are also above by at least two ticks the high-low activator, which is our buy stop. And at that point, because we have hit this rule, profit protection rule number two, both must be qualified. At that moment, we take profit on all our position. We do not have to wait for the close. Can be utilized in real time or end of day. Conceptually, the plan is identical to the real-time basic T-bond plan, but this can be traded end-of-day mode also. The real difference between end-of-day and real-time is that the end-of-day format, you must move the high-low activator one period or one day forward, and the only other difference is rule number four we are also going to see what the effect of moving the HILO activator forward by one period does to the charts and how, is it, how it is utilized uh, when we are trading end of day as opposed to real time. You can trade the basic plan for stocks and shares either in real time or end of day. The major difference being that if you are trading real time, the horizontal part of the high-low activator has to be below the bar of the day that you're actually trading, as we are shown here. And this is the real time mode. If you want to trade end of day style, so you will know where your buy and sell points are for tomorrow that you can give to your broker, you have to go into the Hyler Activator Edit window, and you see it says real time, yes or no. At the moment, it was set for real time. If you're trading end of day, you set it for no, double click, exit, and automatically the Fibonacci Trader program pushes that Hyler Activator one day forward, so you have a number to act with for tomorrow, which is in the area of 10401. So if you have a valid buy or sell signal utilizing the rules, you will see immediately what that number may be for tomorrow. And if you work your way through the trades piece by piece, I think you will see that the rules work reasonably well end of day or real time for stocks and shares. There is approximately, I would say, uh, 25 years of backtest, which uh, has some quality valuation abilities to make trading judgments for yourself. As you can see that this is a swing that is very short-lived, another swing that is short-lived, never takes out the high of two periods back, but it does take out the high of the most immediate one. Therefore, even though it was in a downtrend, congestion style downtrend, you have a situation that it does take out the previous peak, and we have an uptrend situation as we enter this particular uh, tail end of August. The professional trading plan varies considerably from the basic trading plan, but the most important point is that it trades against the trend as well as with the trend. I'm sure by the time you have checked the rules carefully, you will see not only are the differences subtle, but also some of these rules are more complicated and you need really to focus fully before you attempt to trade or to backtest this particular plan. 
not only does the plan trade against the trend, but also it utilizes the next time period's high-low activator. In other words, if you're trading the daily bars, the weekly high-low activator comes into focus and you will have to learn how to cope with this as it is a very important part of the multiple time frame trading concept. And this is a contra-trend trading rule where we are trading against the trend. And the top half of the page, contra-trend trading, is the long entry to buy. Of course, if you're going to buy against the trend, the trend has to be down, which you can see it is that it is a dashed line all the way until the previous peak is taken out when it changes to an uptrend. But we take action before the trend changes and therefore we are acting contra trend. And the rule is relatively simple. If the trend is down, which it is, and you're going to buy, you can buy when the prices close above the high-low activator buy stop as shown in bar number A, but that is only your signal. Your actual buy stop is on bar B when the high of bar A is taken out. That becomes your actual buy stop. Question, can you enter even after bar B, in other words, let's say bar B does not take at the high of bar A. Yes, you can. And that's why it says you can enter even after bar B, providing the high of bar A is taken out. And remember, bar A is your signal bar because that is the one that closed over the high-low activator. The bottom half of the page shows you a contra-trend trading, short entry. The market is in an uptrend, solid line, denotes an uptrend. And we have a close below the high-low activator sell stop, just at this point. This is our signal bar. The very next day, when prices take out the low of bar A, which was our signal bar, you are free to sell it via bar B. Question, what if bar B does not take out the low of bar A? Then you are still able to sell it any time after that, be it the bar after B, after C, after D, so on and so forth. And then it tells you clearly, you can enter even after bar B providing the low of bar A is taken out. In other words, the low of the signal bar must be taken out. Profit protection rule number two, penetration of own period high-low activator. This particular point has to be discussed and explained slightly to understand the concepts behind it. We are short the prices proceed on downwards, and the moment the prices project through or proceed through the high-low activator buy stop by two ticks, we will take profits or losses on all our contracts. Please, it tells you clearly, do not wait for the close. We come to the point of the two tick business. Two ticks is the correct amount as far as my backtrack is concerned on this particular professional plan. Psychologically, it gets you out very, very fast. Now, if you are going to be doing the same rules with a backtrack on other commodities such as wheat, S&P, the currencies, whatever, please realize you will have to check yourself by eyeballing it and making note at what point 
is it no longer on an average basis valid for you to hold a short position? The two ticks works very nicely intra-bar for the T-bonds. If you are trading wheat, it may be four ticks or one cent. S&P will be again a different number because whilst the market rhythm is identical for all commodities, it is the vibration of each one that is slightly different that you have to take note of because there is no what you can call a true universal plan that works in the same way to the same tick on every single commodity and every single share. This is one of my favorite parts, advanced concepts using multiple time frames. I'm going to let you work your way through how the multiple time frames are created. Once you have worked with it, it's reasonably simple. And if you look at the laws of multiple time frames on page 364, the most important point that has to be forcefully made is point number one, that every time frame has its own structure. Each daily price activity, to give us a definition for the entire week, if you follow along carefully from the book, you can see that during the weekly swing down from three down to four, even though until about 68, this is the IBM daily chart, the trend was still up on weekly basis and did not change until the weekly valley at point two was taken out when it became downtrend. Nevertheless, the slope was already down on weekly basis from 74, which was the peak at number three. Therefore, when there was a weekly peak forming at number three, and the slope started moving downwards, at that point, you could have realized that if we are going to trade in the direction of the weekly slope, we should be selling the daily bars. In other words, it is the weekly slope first and then the weekly trend second that sets the direction in which you would be looking to trade the lower time period down, i.e. the daily. In other words, it is the slope and the trend of the next time period up that defines the tradable trend that we should be looking to take action in that direction. Same thing applies when you're looking from the low of week number one, where I'm pointing to, which is a weekly valley at point number four. Even though it was in a downtrend all the way up until a weekly peak, number three, was taken out, we did not wait for this to take action. But as the weekly slope turned up, we'd be looking to buy it via the daily. In other words, if the daily gave a buy signal via any different concepts or methodologies that are discussed in the book, or utilizing your own entry and exit rules, you will see that this gives a very reasonable, clear area in which to take action in. You can see in a reasonably way that when we come to advanced chart number five, what in fact happened when you start combining the daily swings with the weekly swings on one chart, which are the daily chart. 
I think it is uh, quite important that you should realize that the definitions for all time periods are identical, apropos the trend, the slope, support, and resistance, which makes it easier for us to make trading decisions on the basis of multiple time frame application. If we will just look for the moment at some of the areas that we were working with, let us start with area weekly valley number four, where the prices proceeded on upwards, even though they were in a downtrend mode until they took out the weekly peak number three, as we saw in the previous chart, chart number four, advanced chart number four, before it came an uptrend, and the weekly trend changed here. The daily trend, which you can see in a smaller way, changed at point C. At point C was a daily peak. And when the daily peak at C was taken out, and you can see this is the daily swing, became solid at around 69 area, and where it's marked clearly, the daily trend changed here. Therefore, if the weekly slope is up, which is our main direction finder as far as which direction do we want to trade in, therefore, if the weekly slope is up and we're looking to trade in the direction of the slope, which is up, then we will utilize the daily bars to make entry in the direction of the weekly slope or the weekly trend, whichever is coinciding with the daily action point. The daily slope is least on the importance but the weekly slope is number one as far as the immediate trend direction is concerned for the tradable trend. We're not talking about the weekly trend itself, which only, as you can see, changed only at about uh, 75 area, which was much too late to enter the trade. But it was pretty obvious what was happening is that if the weekly slope is up and the daily is also in an upslope, then that's a reasonable area to start thinking in buying the market. And you can see what happened, how the market suddenly gapped and started moving to the upside by approximately uh, just under $10 from the day the daily trend physically changed intra-bar. This is one of the ways that you can utilize the concepts of course, the same thing applies when we are trading intraday. If the intraday basis, the daily slope is up, and you get a buy signal via your intraday, be it the 45 minutes on the S&P, or be it the 50 minutes on the bonds, or whatever time frame you decide to trade, if you trade in the direction of the daily slope, of course, this will help the trading quite considerably. Of course, if you take the point that if the daily slope is up and the daily trend is also up, much more emphasis must be placed on taking trades in that specific direction. I think that this particular section should be studied carefully and it will give you ideas that you can really work with, although it does not affect the standalone plans that have been discussed previously and are disclosed in the book. And the nice thing is that if you get a buy or sell signal via the mechanical rules that are fully supported 
by the multiple time frame applications, then it is a very nice area to start taking the trade in. Well, dear trader, we spent a very brief 60 minutes together talking about the basics of GAN swing charting, and we hope to meet again in the near future. And until we do, I wish you joy, great trading, and may your God go with you. Mm -hmm.